Well, thank you very much for joining us at this press conference with the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights Situation in the Democratic People's Republic of, uh, of Korea, Mr. Thomas Ohea Quintana. And thank you for joining us here in person as well. We I just wanted to point out that Mr. Ohea Quintana did conclude the interactive discussion with the Human Rights Council this morning. You have copies of his statement along with the press release that was shared with you today at noon. I'll turn over immediately to Mr. Quintana. I should note that he was appointed in 2016, so this is, was in fact his, uh, his last presentation to the Human Rights Council six years on. Uh, he's still on the job for another few months, but I just wanted to emphasize that. So over to you, Thomas, and uh, then we'll take your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction and welcome all of you to this uh, press conference. Uh, I, yes, in fact, I just addressed the Human Rights Council. Uh, this might, by, might be the last time that I uh, discuss the human rights situation in the Democratic People's Republic of Korea with the members of the Human Rights Council. My mandate will finish by the end of July. Um, so hopefully there is no uh, need for a new Human Rights Council session uh, in the DPR Korea. Um, it was a very important discussion today, although, again, uh, I regret that the, uh, special, the, the representative of the DPR Korea was not present in the room, uh, so uh, we didn't have uh, the possibility to exchange views in this interactive dialogue here in Geneva with the government itself. Um, but I, I think that uh, still we had a very, very meaningful um, exchange with other delegations and with the chair of the Human Rights Council, especially emphasizing the need to, you know, to have a new approach to the, to the human rights situation in North Korea and stressing the need to uh, seek cooperation, to open up the country. And for that, uh, uh, as, is, is, as it has been outlined in, in the press release and in the statement and in my report, one of the main uh, and urgent a um, recommendation on my side is to uh, facilitate access North, the North Korea to uh, full vaccination of their population. Um, so then um, there is a possibility that North Korea will gradually open up, reopen the borders, and that might also bring chances to discuss broader issues. The, unfortunately, throughout these six years of my mandate, the human rights situation in the Democratic People's Republic of Korea has not improved. And um, one of the most serious concerns has to do with the political prison camps called Kualiso, uh, it's a Korean uh, denomination, uh, where we know that uh, thousands of people are being sent there. Their situation, legally speaking, legally speaking entail enforced disappearance of persons, which is a serious crime against humanity and the Rome Statute. And that's why uh, I uh, also recommended today to the Human Rights Council members to continue to um, um, uphold the accountability agenda. Uh, um, North Korea needs to cease uh, these crimes against humanity uh, and the, the international community needs to continue to play a role so the message is passed that uh, 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 the Human Rights Council of the United Nations would not accept the ongoing crimes against humanity in the DPR Korea. Um, so I think um, I will stop there. Uh, I made a last point today about the, the concerns about escalation of hostilities in the Korean Peninsula. Um, we are not witnessing, witnessing the situation in Ukraine and, and what, how devastated the, the war could be. And the situation in the Korean Peninsula could rapidly and dangerously um, escalate. And uh, it is critical for all parties involved to try to seek diplomacy and go back to the diplomacy uh, channels in the Korean Peninsula. And now to conclude, I made a special call for the good offices of Secretary, Secretary General of the United Nations 
to play a more active role, role in diplomacy in the Korean Peninsula, and uh, I called member states to enable the good offices of the Security General to play this kind of role. So I will conclude there, and let's open for your question. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas, and uh, now to you for your questions. Isabel of Spanish News Agency. Go ahead, Isabel, in the room. Yes, good afternoon. Ah, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I would like to, if uh, if you can uh, elaborate on what you mean by uh, the, the, your call uh, of a needed new approach to the situation in North Korea. What do you mean by new approach? Uh, and also um, on the situation of uh, what has meant for the population of North Korea, the, the, the closure of the, of the country during this uh, last two years? I, how exactly, how long have been they closed this, since the beginning of the pandemic? Or how, what, is the, what has been the impact in the, for the population? And you said that uh, maybe they will uh, accept to change a little bit and maybe accept to vaccinate uh, their population. What makes you think uh, that uh, this, this can happen? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, when I say a new approach, I'm thinking about, and I said it today at the session, uh, here the United Nations needs to recognize, acknowledge the steps taken by North Korea in their engagement with the human rights framework. For example, they participated in the Universal Periodical Review process and they accepted 132 recommendations. Um, in 2017, the Special Rapporteur of the Right of Persons with Disability visited the country on an official mission that was very important. Um, the, the government participated in the, in, the, in, the, in, in the treaty bodies mechanisms, CIDAW, Child's Committee, uh, they brought an important delegation to Geneva, and um, they also participated in a, a training workshop in Geneva as well with the Office of the High Commission of Human Rights. We, and there are many other interactions, and not even with, with human rights mechanisms, but also with other UN mechanisms like sustainable development goals, uh, mechanism, uh, uh, and others. So uh, what I believe is that we need to put those uh, uh, developments uh, on the table of, or, or I mean, or, or in, the, in the agenda of the human rights in North Korea. Uh, it is a time to start using these important decisions being made probably at the capital city to engage with these mechanisms. We need to further explore opportunities on that. For example, uh, I believe that a second visit of the Special Rapporteur of the Right of Persons with Disabilities, a follow-up visit, it's, 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 it, needs, it needs to be um, um, it, I mean, discussed with the government. Uh, to basically start operating on the ground, you know, so that so the UN UN mechanisms start uh, gaining access to the country. You know, it's a gradual process, but we need to keep being consistent on that. Um, I believe that other thematic reporters, for example, the special reporter on water and sanitation, he had a a, a, a contact with the North Korean government here. Uh, in, in Geneva, and I, I have been encouraging the, the current reporter on water and sanitation to, to try to continue to build this kind of trust relationship with the government, you know, with the idea, or again, of, of visiting the country. You may know, especially I see here, um, Stephanie, I have uh, spoken about this before, you know, uh, but I, I think it's worth to repeat it because uh, these are really entry points, and that's why I mean by, by uh, a new approach. And I hope the Human Rights Council takes hold of that and push for more engagement, and also the Office of the High Commission of Human Rights. The North Korean human rights agenda has been uh, subject to any kind of progress on the denuclearization agenda. 
And I don't think that needs to be the case. I still believe that we can still discuss human rights regardless of the uh, progress on the denuclearization agenda. And I want to be very clear on that. So that's what I say when I, that, that's what I say when I say new approach. Um, and then your second question was about. Uh, Yes. Um, at first, I should say that uh, almost all countries around the world closed borders when the pandemic started. So I think the North Korean decision to close borders had to do with their obligation to protect the right of adequate health of their population. So, and this is what I said at the beginning in March 2020, where the government decided to close the border. It was not a, an arbitrary decision, it was a decision made to protect the North Korean people from an, from an outbreak of COVID-19 in the country. But that's very important also as a matter of trying to understand the government and trying to uh, acknowledge what they do. Now, today, I also said that these decisions to completely close the border has been too long. And uh, there is no need for the government to uh, reopen the, the, the borders. And for that, they are, they, they, they are expecting to uh, vaccinate their population, as many other countries in the world. Their interaction with those partners like COVAX and some others has been difficult. And that's, we know that, and the government even rejected some a, a number of vaccines, but they, are, they still want to basically go forward with, with the vaccination of their population. So on the side of the international community, there is a challenge, as I put it in my statement, try to facilitate the access to full vaccination. I cannot give you details on that, whether it is going to be a donation, how is North Korea going to pay for that, what kind of vaccines what would that be? But that, that's what I think needs to be done, you know, basically to break this level of isolation. We don't have UN country team. We don't have humanitarian agencies on the ground. You know, the information scars. Uh, so, uh, but what we know still is that under this level of isolation, basically due to the uh, restriction of COVID-19 pandemic, two things. On the one hand, the population who used to, you know, rely on exchanges, especially with China through trade and other, you know, relation, uh, commercial relations uh, has stopped. Uh, and, and, and people basically in the uh, provinces, ordinary citizens rely for their livelihood on, on used to rely on, on those kind of exchanges, commercial exchanges. So therefore, their situation is, is quite serious in respect to social and economic rights. But on the other hand, the government, according to the measures that they have taken, is using COVID-19 pandemic to to increase control on the population without, again, without international observers, without international personnel, plus the passing of legislation, uh, recent legislation last December, uh, uh, legislation that uh, punishes even with death penalty access to uh, information that the government perceives undermines the state, and even death penalty if if that information is from foreign states, from foreign states. Uh, and I also mentioned here the, the, the shoot on site orders, you know, for those who want to leave the country or enter the country. All those are related to the COVID-19 restrictions. So uh, in order to also uh, prevent further deterioration of these civil rights, the right to life of the people, we need to offer North Korea alternatives to open the borders again. Sorry, it was a longer response, but I think it was worth. Indeed, very worth it. Uh, thank you very much for that. And we have a question now from Nina of Agence France Press. Go ahead, Nina. Hi. Hi, uh, 
Hi, thank you for taking my question. So um, a few things, you mentioned the, uh, the prison camps. I was wondering if you have any uh, numbers, uh, if you have any idea of how many people are in those camps now. Um, you also mentioned that people might be starving uh, due to this increased food insecurity. Um, what, do you have any numbers or any sort of, can you quantify that in any way? And then also just uh, last, really, uh, in connection with the crisis in, in Ukraine, um, how do you see, I don't know if you could put that in, in sort of a perspective with, with the crisis there and, uh, you know, another nuclear armed state that, are, how do you think that could impact the isolation of North Korea or, or the willingness of countries to, to uh, interact? Thank you. All right. Um, yeah, very, very relevant question. Thanks. Um, so the political prison camps. Um, the basic information about the figures that you're asking about, uh, I would say that only comes from the findings of the Commission of Inquiry in 2014. Uh, the Commission of Inquiry, Inquiry determined that about um, 120,000 people are being held in political prison camps. I haven't been able to uh, um, verify or uh, affirm uh, now in 2022 to what extent that the figures that uh, um, represent the reality of the political prison camps at the moment. But we know, and uh, uh, throughout my mandate, I have heard many stories about how people in North Korea fear being sent to these political prison camps. I said this before. This is an evidence that they continue to exist. I have heard accounts that without the existence of political prison camps, and this is a more uh, analytical assessment, but without political prison camps, the system, the regime, political regime in North Korea will not survive without the existence of political prison camps. People fe fear being sent to these places. Even people in Pyongyang, the so-called elite, uh, they are, there is anger. I heard that there is um, anger, but um, any chances to express dissent is, you know, suppressed with the threats of being sent to political prison camps. Um, and we still have some satellite images about these camps. Uh, so uh, it's quite challenging to determine how is life of prisoners in these political prison camps. Uh, we know that uh, there are schools for guards. We know that in some of these political prison camps, there's even education for the uh, children of prisoners. In some situations, pre political prison camps look like huge villages where people cannot live. In some other political prison camps, the prisons are being used for forced labor in, 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 in mine, coal mines and other kind of mines. Uh, so we are trying to uh, basically, or I am trying to basically um, make my conclusions, make my conclusions based on the information that I have been receiving throughout these years. And this is all what I can say about the political prison camps. And I repeat that the government needs to uh, uh, cooperate and uh, allow access for uh, the international community to these places. I constantly uh, call the government of North Korea to release prisoners. There is a practice in North Korea to uh, issue amnesties for releasing prisoners. We, we, we periodically see uh, information about these decisions coming from the leadership. I really urge the leadership to continue to release prisoners, especially those most vulnerable. And ultimately, of course, I call for the dismantlement of these uh, facilities. 
on the issue of a uh, right to adequate food. Uh, first, I made a point today in the session. Uh, we need to have more information from single member states, especially those in the border area. I'm talking about China in particular. About what is the level of ass food assistance that they are providing. Uh, we, the United Nations, need to know how, it, whether China and how China is helping North Korea to uh, prevent uh, further uh, food insecurity in the country. Uh, and uh, I would really, really welcome an engagement with the Chinese government on that because it's very important, has been very concerning the issue of food security. Uh, and uh, in terms of um, figures, it's very difficult to, to say. I share with you, and it is in the, in the statement, uh, the, the figures in, in terms of uh, food insecurity in the country, uh, almost 40% of the population face food, food insecurity. Uh, um, we, have the, uh, we have the situation of um, mortal maternity uh, the, uh, connected to uh, malnutrition. Uh, we have serious figures in stunting, children facing stunting. But overall, uh, what I can say to you in terms of more details is, is that especially elder, elder population in the border, in, in the provinces, uh, elder population in North Korea, prisoners, and also we know that the so-called the Kochevi, so, the, so the, the orphans in North Korea who uh, somehow the government has some level of uh, assistance to to, 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 to um, help the orphans, but some of them are uh, uh, living just, you know, on their own. These, especially these sectors, may be facing hunger and starvation. Uh, and the last question, I, uh, I'm not sure what exactly it was about, but um, yes, definitely, uh, the nuclear, uh, the progress in the nuclear capability of North Korea, it's extremely concerning. Uh, I said today that the government should allocate, should prioritize allo allocation of resources to basic rights, including adequate food. Um, the Security Council of the, of the United Nations affirms that the government is diverting those resources for the nuclear program. Um, so if that's, if that's the case, I urge North Korea to prioritize allocation of resources to the needs of, of the population. Um, and again, it's quite concerning throughout these six years, as I said today at the beginning of my statement, I, I witnessed political tensions in 2016 when North Korea started with the missiles. Then was a very encouraging period of rapprochement and negotiations in 2018 and 2019. I should say, why I am saying encouraging? Because I, 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 was, uh, I was really uh, of the idea that these uh, negotiations will offer entry points, concrete entry points to further uh, uh, expand the human rights agenda. And let me give you an example. During those times, those years, I was engaging with the US government very closely and with the ROK government, offering them a roadmap on how to introduce, how to expand the human rights agenda. We know, I'm going to be very clear with you, we know that, uh, you know, during these kind of negotiations, the, part, the, the parties are really reluctant to speak about human rights. Sometimes they want to put it aside of the agenda. And we need to understand that. We, should, we, not, we don't need just to finger point. We need to say, okay, we understand. The, the, we, we, we understand the difficulties and how difficult is this kind of negotiations and that uh, bringing human rights discussion may jeopardize the negotiations. That's, that's what has happened at that time. But I was ready to provide them a roadmap. And when I say a roadmap, I say, you should 
including the negotiations, the commitment of the government to engage with the special rapporteur, to start talking with the UN human rights mechanisms, to invite him on the ground, to engage with the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights in, in, a, in a sustained you know, uh, process. So that those are very simple ideas on how to introduce human rights in the negotiations for the nuclearization. Uh, and then the pandemic came, and the pandemic, we all know how, how, how the pandemic brought, uh, I mean, uh, you know, difficulties all over the world in all agendas, including in this case, the human rights agenda of North Korea. Now, my fear is that there's gonna be a, another cycle of escalations in the Korean Peninsula, um, a Korean Peninsula in which North Korea has shown nuclear, already nuclear capability, has shown missile technology, ballistic missile technology evolving rapidly. So uh, I made very, very clear points with the relevant stakeholders during this time here in Geneva, but I also have been in Seoul uh, 15 days ago, especially with the UN, US, and they are okay, the Japanese, uh, and also I made publicly the point with the China and Russia. There is no time to escalate North Korea. There is a challenge to do otherwise. And especially this is a message to the ROK government, the new administration. I hope that we learn lessons from the past, from the recent past. Um, and that will, again, as I say, uh, will allow for a human rights, uh, for entry points to address uh, human rights uh, is if, if, we, if we prevent this kind of es escalation in the Korean Peninsula. Thank you very much. We have a question up from Peter Kenny of Andalou News Agency. Peter, go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you for taking my question, Mr. Quintana. I, th I think I heard you correctly that you had mentioned that with the start of the, the uh, uh, Ukraine invasion that um, you, there were concerns about the firing of missiles from North Korea. In fact, I think after there had been quite a lull period, uh, missile firing seemed to have started again. Have you recorded, uh, made any recording of the frequency of these attacks since the Ukraine invasion started. Thank you. I'm not making any connection. I don't see any direct connection with the war in Ukraine. I don't. Actually, on the contrary, uh, the, the way that North Korea government behaves, uh, it's, uh, it has some of some um, rationale. During the uh, rapprochement and negotiations in 2018 and 2019, this government publicly declared that there was, go there was a moratorium in testing both nuclear and missile. Uh, and uh, after the negotiations stalled, basically after the failure of the Hanoi summit, unfortunately, uh, at some point, the leadership declared that the moratorium is over, was over. So all this happened before the Ukraine war, and uh, and now they they started again with this quite concerning missile tests uh, of different kind of. Um, but anyway, I try not to um, discuss the security agenda. That does not fall into, on my mandate, although I do discuss these issues with the Security Council members. I visited New York in October last year and also, and also Washington DC, and I did discuss with them the security issue, including, by the way, the issue of the negative impact of sanctions from the Security Council uh, against 
the living condition of ordinary citizens in, in, in North Korea. And I have to recognize that the Security Council members has been opened to listen to me, to discuss these issues. They fastened the exemptions a procedure for humanitarian aid. And let me tell you one more thing. Throughout these years, I, ha I have noticed that um, the kind of uh, uh, tensions in the Korean Peninsula against, especially in North Korea, due to their progress in the nuclear program and ballistic missiles, has somehow impede to, this, to have any kind of discussion with regards to providing development aid to North Korea. At some point, humanitarian assistance is accepted. And I even should say that in some times, even uh, during pensions in 2016, I heard from member states that they were not even ready to provide humanita humanitarian assistance, which uh, it's really something that doesn't go in line with the uh, UN principles. But now, and today at the Human Rights Council, I made the point that I think that the, U the executive boards of the UN agencies need to be open to discuss development assistance to North Korea in water and sanitation, health, help them basically, you know, improve their health infrastructure. If we wanna, if we want the government to fight COVID-19 after opening the borders, they need to improve the health infrastructure. And that has to do with development. It's not just humanitarian assistance. You have the issue of water and sanitation, drinking, drinkable water in the provinces most of the people don't have access to that. Hygiene, hygiene and many other uh, very important human rights issues that are recognized in human rights treaties, which also are connected to development. That's why uh, I, I have made this recommendation to executive, executive boards of the UN agencies to start allowing our colleagues working on the ground, operating in the country, allow them to do what they see when they are there. Because if you talk to the, the people working on the ground from the United Nations, they tell you that they see that something else is required. And of course, there are challenges in regards to monitoring, you know, access, many, many challenges. But I think it's for the United Nations to really uh, face those challenges. Thank you very much. We have uh, one more question from Gabriela Sotomayor of El Proceso of Mexico. Gabriela, Gabi, go ahead. Yes, thank you so much, Rolando. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Mr. Quintana, you said that uh, the numbers that you have on the camps come from the Commission of Inqu Inquiry. And uh, now your mandate will be over. So do you think that there should be another Commission of Inquiry or what else? To, to pressure uh, the, the government. And then uh, what do you think that Mrs. Bachelet should do uh, uh, concretely in, in this regard? And then uh, last question is for Rolando, uh, if he can answer this question at the end of the press conference. Uh, on the Commission of Inquiry in, in Ukraine, when the president is going to, to announce the members of the Commission of Inquiry in Ukraine, if, if Rolando can update us because I mean, the war is still going on and, and the clock is ticking, I think. Thank you. Well, I, I, I think what is needed is to strengthen the follow-up on the implementation of the recommendation of the Commission of Inquiry. That's, that's my response to your question. Uh, Commission of Inquiry should not be established just to put pressure. Commissions of inquiry are established when the Human Rights Council has enough evidence that indicate widespread and human rights abuses. And therefore, there is a need to move a step forward 
to analyze the facts in a time-bound and specific uh, territory. So that has happened with the Commission of Inquiry in North Korea, groundbreaking report. Uh, and I, again, I think what is needed now is to follow up on their recommendations. But together with that, and look, I have been very clear also today, uh, accountability when we are in front of a scenario of widespread human rights abuses is key to uh, think about a future where rights are respected. Uh, and let me just bring you back to my experience as the Myanmar Special Rapporteur in 2008, from 2008 to 2014. In 2010, right before the militars were holding elections in Myanmar, after 40 years of military regime, 40 years of human rights abuses against ethnic minorities in all parts of the country, against Burmese civilians, including Aung San Suu Kyi, who was being held in uh, house arrest. Uh, I called for the Human Rights Council to establish a commission of inquiry. But also, I remember very well raising uh, my concern with the this, this, this civil community that there was a need to review the past. There was a need to address those violations. And it was for the people of Myanmar to decide how to do it, whether it is a truth commission or, or something. Those are the lessons learned from the uh, history of the United Nations for a transition towards democracy or for a transition towards, towards civilian government. You need to address human rights violations, why, one way or another. So that's why, in the, and the, my point of view is that that was one of the reasons why Myanmar is now under this situation, because the opportunity, opportunity was missed at that time to really put a stop and put a halt to the power of the military and to make them accountable and to make them respond to what happened for 40 years. That was a missed opportunity, really. So that's why here now with the DPR Korea mandate, I'm urging member states to listen to our expertise because, because we are engaging to all parties in the conflict. We, the reporters, are listening to everybody. And that's, that's the value of the mandate because allow us to then try to address the, prop, the proper, the most suitable approach to address human rights. In this case, uh, with North Korea, uh, so then in this case with North Korea, accountability initiatives need to be taken. We need to take concrete, concrete action. We know that the referral to the International Criminal Court is not working. And it's not only with North Korea, it's happening with many other situations. But we need to continue to make the point. These are crimes against humanity. And the UN body is the International Criminal Court to deal with that. So if that's not gonna happen, let's explore other initiatives because the authorities in North Korea need to know that they will have to respond sooner or later for the crimes being committed. So that's one thing that it is connected to your question about the Commission of Inquiry. But again, uh, please, this is what I urge today, uh, member states, please uh, use my report. My report includes a road map, concrete road map on how to engage with North Korea on human rights. And I am asking the High Commissioner to respond to your question, the High Commissioner for Human Rights, to take hold of, of, the, of that roadmap and to take a leadership. I even in past reports recommended a visit of the Special Rapporteur to North Korea. So my point is 
we need to have a more active role here in Geneva on the human rights agenda. Who other would that, would that be? We shouldn't let only member states to deal with that. We are the impartial and independent and multilateral body. Who else will be the one trying to engage with North Korea other than the Human Rights Council, other than the High Commissioner for Human Rights, other than my mandate and other reporters? Because ultimately, and this is something that Rolando remind me, I brought this I brought this before to Geneva, I think, and also to New York. This is a lock, old lock from North Korea. It was given, uh, it was given to me this lock by an SKP, a woman SKP, who I met in, in South Korea. And she gave me this lock. And she said, I brought this lock from Korea. And she said, this lock represents our situation in North Korea. And I'm giving this to you as a UN representative because we believe that it is the United Nations who has the key to, this, to, to unlock this, this chain. Uh, so having, this is probably my last presence here in Geneva as reporter. I think it was worth to bring this to show this to you. This is coming from North Korea. This is what represents. And to unlock this, uh, this chain, uh, we need to, uh, we need to um, apply all of our wisdom and all, all our uh, mechanisms, or all, all our um, alternative that, that we have to open up North Korea. Uh, so well, I stop there. I don't know if Randall have a question there. But. Thank you, Thomas. I, I really don't want to use your press conference, okay, yeah. but I can simply just note that it's absolute priority of Ambassador Vijega as the President of the Council to appoint uh, the members of the Commission of Inquiry on Ukraine, and we'll, we will uh, certainly uh, inform you well in advance. Uh, I just also wanted to point out there is a resolution on the DPRK which is tabled, um, which does heed much of the advice of, of the Special Rapporteur who I thank very much for your six years of service of helping put the spotlight on the situation in human rights in, in DPRK. And uh, hopefully this is not the last time we see you. So thank you very much for everything. And thank you all for joining us here at this press conference.